Fabulous monsters. The Watcher in the Waves, Chapter 1 One year, spring forgot to come to one particular Viking tribe. The sun did not shine, the snow did not melt, the crops did not grow, and the people began to starve. My friends, roared the king. Olaf the violent over the rumbling of everyone's empty stomachs, I have a jolly good think about our problem. What we need is a clear, intelligent, and sensible plan to get us out of this mess. So, I propose... The king took a deep breath. Everyone leaned forward to hear his wisdom. I propose, he continued, that we get in our longship and find another tribe of Vikings and bash them over the head. Hooray, cheered all the men. What, sneered all the women. How is that going to put food on our tables exactly? Dear ladies, said King Olaf. He was surprised and a little hurt. And the women of his tribe hadn't seen how brilliant his idea was. That is a Viking's answer to every problem. We know, said the woman bitterly. Well, it's bound to work eventually, said King Olaf. The woman of the village threw their hands up in despair, but the men polished their spiky helmets and sharpened their war axes. They stuck extra nails into their battle hammers and prepared for war. All the men, that is, except one. He was young and his name was Snorri the Dreamer. Snorri had never been very keen on fighting. He would much rather have read the great sagas and watched the sunset. He loved nature and enjoyed going for long walks to explore the fjord and the countryside around the village. In other words, he's stupid, said Halfton, the unhinged. Halfton, don't be so rude about your brother, snapped their mother, and she smacked Halfton over the head with a heavy frying pan. Well, said Halfton, after he picked himself up off the floor and stopped screaming, we have a noble tradition in his family. We're Berserkers, shield cheers, headbangers. Since the beginning of time, we've had the special privilege of being first into battle, the first to charge screaming at the enemy. The first to get killed, said Snorri. Exactly, said Halfden with a proud smile. As everyone knows, every Viking who dies bravely in battle goes straight to Halfala, where there's food and drink and singing forever and ever. Until, said Snorri. Until Ragnarok, said Halfden. The great battle at the end of time, when good and evil clash and everything gets destroyed and you get to die bravely all over again. Whoopee! I do hope when I die it's long and messy and extremely painful. Look at the world around you, Hafton, says Snorri. The sea, the sky, the beautiful countryside. Goodness knows when we have little enough time to enjoy already. Why would you want to make your life even shorter? Before Hafton could answer, his mum smacked Snorri over the head with a very heavy frying pan. Sorry, Snorri, she said, but your brother's right. We have traditions in his family. Chapter 2 When Snorri woke up, he was sitting in the longship next to his brother. Someone had dressed him up in his battle gear and stuck a sword in his hand. At last! He is awake! Ow! Kind of you to join us, you worthless spawn of sniveling sea scum! Bellowed a massive viking straight into Snorri's face. Oh, hello, Uncle Eric, said Snorri. How's Auntie Agnetha? Still mad, thanks for asking, bellowed Uncle Her Eric. I bet you're excited now, aren't you, asked Hafton. I've got the worst headache of my life. Uncle Eric's just shouting at me so loudly, I think my brains have turned to soup, and I'm about to be violently killed, says Nori. Of course I'm excited. Me too, said Hafton. He looked like a little boy waiting for Christmas morning. Oh, bother, says Nori suddenly. What's the matter, said Hafton. Forgot my pajamas, says Snorri. This is a Viking raiding party, said Hafton. You won't be needing your pajamas. What? Go to sleep the night before an important battle without my special gym jams on? says Snorri. Not likely. I won't get my proper rest, and I'll be all grumpy, and not really take the fun out of being horribly killed. Won't be long. Before Hafton could stop him, Snorri had jumped out of the longship and run off. Snorri knew that he went home, the Viking warriors would find him and drag him straight back to the ship. So instead, he followed the street, steep path up the side of the fjord to his favourite place. He planned to wait there until he saw the longship was far out to sea. You haven't got any special gym jams, Snorri jumped. Hafton, how did you find me? I may be incredibly thick, but I'm not stupid, said Hafton. 
You're always going on about you watching the sunset, and this is the best place to see it for miles around. Now, hurry up. The king doesn't want to miss the tide. He's not going to, says Snoring, and he pointed. Down below them, the longship slipped out of the fjord and made the open sea. Oh, what? cried Hafton. Well, that's just brilliant, isn't it? Buying goes my chance to get horribly killed. I hope you're proud of yourself. I could have been on the end of someone's sword by half past three. I could have been in Vanhalla in time for tea. So, how am I going to get paradise now, Mr. Brainbox? Look around you, Hafton, says Snorri. You're in paradise already. Hafton had to agree. Even with all the snow and ice everywhere, it was a beautiful spot, but he was still very angry. In any case, says Snorri, we have a serious problem. There's no food and pretty soon our problem, our people are going to start dying. I can't imagine. The king's plan is going to do any good, so it's up to us to save the tribe. What can we do? asked Hafton. I've been thinking about that, says Snorri. We can go fishing. How? said Hafton. We can borrow Canute, the stinky boat, but it stinks! Obviously. And in any case, says Hafton, we're rubbish at fishing. That doesn't matter, says Nori. I remember reading that the best place to go ship fishing is in the waters just above where the kraken lurks. There are always plenty of fish, and they swim straight into your nets. It's perfect. Perfect, except for one thing, said Hafton. The kraken isn't going to let us pinch all those fish. It's a ginormous man-eating sea monster that looks like a gigantic crab. It looks like a gigantic octopus, says Snorri. Crab! Octopus! Crab! Octopus! Does it matter, says Snorri? The important thing is that the plan is dangerous. And this is bound to result in almost certain death. Is it? said Hafton. Well, why didn't you say so before? What are we waiting for? Chapter 3 Snorri was right. There were plenty of fish in the waters above the Kraken. And they did seem to swim right into the brothers' nets. In no time... Their little boat was piled high with enough fish to feed their tribe for a whole year. Even better, nobody had to get horribly killed by a gigantic octopus, says Snorri. Crab, said Hafton. Octopus, says Snorri. Crab, said Hafton. They were so busy arguing that they didn't notice as the waters around them began to bubble. At last, with a great roar, a monster with the tentacles of a gigantic octopus and the shell and claws of a gigantic crab burst out of the sea. Well, that settles that, says Snorri. We're both right. Afternoon, said the Kraken. I've been watching you two for a while now, but I still can't decide. Decide on what? said Hafton. Which one of you I'm going to eat first, of course, said the Kraken. Before the brothers knew what was happening, the Kraken had grabbed them into great tentacles. It swung them high into the air. Eeny, meeny, my me, my nemo, said the Kraken, chanted. Catch a viking by his toe. If he squeals, eat him. Hooray, squealed Hafton. I'm about to die an extremely painful death. Right, roared the kraken. In you go. Wait, shouted Snorri. Just as the kraken was about to bite Hafton's head off. You're not trying to stop me eating, are you? I hope it says. Sailor try all sorts of clever tricks to stop me eating them. But they never work, you know. How could they? says Snorri. You're far too clever to be tricked by silly little sailors. That is a lovely thing to say, said the Kraken. A truly lovely thing to say. What kind of vicious, heartless creature could eat you both up after you've said something as lovely as that? The Kraken thought for a moment. This one, I cried. I'm starving! I was just thinking that we're going to taste awfully dry, says Snorri. Dry? What are you talking about? said the Kraken. There's water all around us. Yes, but it's salt water, said Snorri. Ugh, it dries out of your mouth. No, everyone knows that. A Viking tastes better when washed down with lashings of lovely rune juice. Rune juice? said the Kraken. Yes, it's a Viking brand of fruit juice. My favorite flavor is apple, said Snorri. Though, some people prefer blackcurrant. Hey, what a stroke of luck. We're not far from an island of Halesi, the home of the sea, a go sea god, Agar. He makes the best rune juice in the world, especially for the gods. In his golden hall, there are cups that refill themselves every time you take a drink. But I'm ginormous, said the Kraken. I can't drink out of some measly little cup. You won't have to, says Snorri. 
Agar is a cauldron full of rune juice that was stolen from the land of the giant. It's five miles deep. What are you waiting for? said the Kraken. He plonked Snow and Halfdan back down the deck in their fishing boat and pushed him all the way to Halesi. For a long time, Halfdan didn't say anything. He just stared at Snowy. Then at last, he did. It was all going brilliantly. I was about to die an extremely painful death. I could have been in Halval Valhalla now if it wasn't for you. It doesn't count, says Snorri. What? said Halfdan. You have to die in battle if you're going to get to Valhalla. Being eaten by a sea monster doesn't count. Even if it's an extremely painful death? Oh look! We're here! As Snorri knew most about the gods from all the sagas he read, he was the one to knock on the door of Aegir's Golden Hall. Don't think you can walk in there and then sneak out of the back and escape, said the Kraken. I'm holding your ship and your brother hostage. At last, snapped Aegir, the sea god, as he opened the great door of his golden hall. We thought you'd never get here. Wait a minute. Who are you? Greetings, mighty god, said Snorri, and he bowed his head. I am Snorri, son of Beowulf, the berserker. My friends and I have come to sample some of your famous runges. Clear off, cried Agar. I am too busy. I have to prepare dinner for all the gods of Asgard and the ingredients for my starter still haven't arrived. Wait till I get my hands on that delivery boy. The only reason I opened the door was that I thought you might be him. Perhaps I can help you, says Snorri. In return for some ranges for me and the companions, I will give you the recipe and the ingredients for a starter worthy of the gods themselves. Really? said Agar. Yes, I call it sea for surprise, says Snorri. If you don't believe me, just look over there. He pointed to where the Kraken was keeping a close eye on Hafton, and the boat was piled high with delicious fish. The gods do like their seafood, said Eager, thoughtfully. All right, but it had to be better be a really wonderful recipe. Inside his magnificent golden ball, Eager poured cups of rune juice for the two Vikings. Then he helped Kraken clamber into the Voss cauldron. Cheers, said Snorri. Cheers, said Eager. Now, come on then. Where is this recipe you promised me? The gods will be here in a few hours. Of course, says Snorri. Give me a pen and paper and I shall write it out for you. So, you do catering for the gods, eh? Halfdan asked Agar. Could you set an argument for me? I want to go to Valhalla. I'm about to die an extremely painful death. But my brother says it doesn't count because I'm going to be eaten by a sea monster, not killed in battle. That reminds me, roared the Kraken as it wallowed in the cauldron of Rungus. I'm supposed to be eating you, Vikings. Come on, sea god, throw them in and I can have them all washed down with the mouthfuls of this delicious drink. Snorri finished writing the recipe and handed it to Agar. This looks like a real winner, said Agar as he reads, Thank you, young Viking. Now, I think we'll be off, Halfdan, said Snorri. Goodbye, Agar. Goodbye, Kraken. But I'm going to devour you, Baldur Kraken. Yes. I'm sorry, but I don't think that will be possible after all, says Snorri. You see, the sea for surprise recipe I've just given to Agar is for Kraken in Rungus. It's very tasty by all accounts. I'm sure the gods will love it. Wait! No! Welled the Kraken. Get me out of here! Get me out! Chapter 4 So, Snorri and Halfdan sailed home from the island of Halesi. When the women of the tribe saw all the delicious fish piled high on their boats, they cheered and set about cooking a scrumptious feast. They were about to sit down to eat when the king and the Viking warriors returned. They looked exhausted and weak from lack of food. We didn't find anyone to bash on the head, said King Olaf quietly. The lads weren't exactly 100%. Not having eaten anything for so long, we couldn't have rolled far. Then it got dark and we were all a bit frightened, so we thought we'd best just come home. Well, there's plenty of food here now, says Snorri. Welcome back! There was such a feasting that night, and dancing and drinking to the health of Snorri and Halfdan, the two great heroes of the tribe. Maybe there is more to life than a horribly painful death, said Hal Halden, as he took a great drink of rune juice. Thank you, brother, for saving me, he said. He and Snorri embraced. By the firelight, they watched as fucking warriors hug the wives and ch children they hadn't expected to see again. Yes, says Snorri. There's a lot to be said for being alive.